is uh, Kim Huber with Embrace Wealth Management. And I have the pleasure of introducing to you the LPL um, uh, cybersecurity team. Well, th there's actually a, a lot more people on the uh, security team than just uh, Mike and Olivia, uh, but they, they gave us the two best. So uh, first with uh, our, uh, our speaker, Mike, Mike Terry is a member of the advisor security team. He's been with LPL for eight years now. And what he does is that he works with um, advisors as well as investors, educating them about uh, cybersecurity and also keeping LPL uh, protected as well. So he goes and uh, talks about best practices and how to uh, protect your um, sensitive information. And then, so before he joined LPL, he was with um, by Capital One and Wells Fargo, some of the uh, uh, big companies, helping them stay protected as well. But on the uh, on the fun note, what Mike likes to do is he likes to spend time with his family as well as bank. And so um, he is really passionate about sourdough. And if you get him going, he is like the Wikipedia of sourdough starter. And, uh, and then for Olivia, Olivia is an analyst on the advisor security team. And she also is responsible and passionate about um, educating advisors as well as their clients on just how to stay safe. And so um, what she does is she helps with the uh, security hotline when you call 1-800-HELP. Uh, she helps demand that line, as well as the security mailbox. Uh, she does risk assessment. She gives presentations. And then um, outside of work, she enjoys uh, traveling. She has a big family. And fun fact point is that she loves watching sports, and she plays the guitar as well. So she plays the acoustic uh, guitar. We were joking about um, how, you know, you really come to appreciate the guitar pick after a while. Um, and that uh, she probably has played Highway to Heaven more than a human should be allowed to do. So um, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn this over to um, Mike and Olivia. And what we'll do too is that there, um, uh, we're going to encourage you to just throw all of your questions into the uh, chat box, and then we'll have conversations after their uh, prepared presentation. Okay? All right. Take it away, guys. All right. Thanks so much, Kim. Uh, that was a, a wonderful welcome. I'll say good afternoon, everyone. I was just smiling as it, everyone joined. It definitely seems like uh, you're all familiar with each other and genuinely happy to be here on this call with each other. So I first just want to start by thanking you. Um, thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedules to you know, spend an hour with us today and learn about cybersecurity. We're going to cover a number of different topics today. And you know, let's be honest, not all these topics are the most exciting topics. They are all important. Um, and so that's why we're here today. Uh, just to provide you with some useful information, some tips that you can implement in your personal life so that you can reduce the risk and stay a little bit safer. All right, so we're going to talk about a number of different things today. We'll start just by talking about how your information stays protected. Uh, then we will talk about different cyber attacks and scams, right, identifying, avoiding them, and just uh, some tips for staying safe. Uh, and then to conclude today's webinar, Olivia is going to give you some information about things that you can do to secure your accounts, uh, protect your family, and protect your home as well. Then, as Kim mentioned at the end, we'll be happy to answer any questions the group might have as well. All right, so I think it's important that before we get started, we just kind of talk about what cybersecurity is at a high level. Um, it's a term that's you know fairly broad, and you hear it used commonly. And so when we're talking about cybersecurity, you know, I'll give you a condensed definition. We're really just talking about, you know, protecting sensitive information from unauthorized access. And it's important to you and you should care because, you know, a lot of times that sensitive information that we're referring to, you know, it's going to belong to you. And bad actors are constantly evolving their tactics, you know, and changing their methods to gain access to this sensitive information, which is very valuable to them, 
once they have access it, you know, they're going to use it to commit fraud in most instances. So on the right hand side of your screen here, we have different types of cyber attacks, right? So we'll start at the bottom and work our way up, right? You have your warfare, terrorism, and espionage attacks. You know what these are going to be are highly complex and really sophisticated attacks. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, they're going to be leading off the evening news as far as with the headlines and not going to really be applicable for us here at LPL or for Kim and team. We're not going to be the direct target for those types of attacks. You know, they're going to actually impact critical infrastructure, you know, here within our country or elsewhere around the world. So what we're going to talk about today are really social engineering attacks. These can be carried out by hackers, cyber criminals. Sometimes there's the insider threat, right, where you have angry or disgruntled employees as well. All right, so before we actually start talking about some of those attacks, uh, I think it's important that we just talk at a high level again about how we keep your information protected, right? Uh, and so we understand that it starts with you. We understand that these are your accounts, and within these accounts uh, is going to be your sensitive information as well as your assets. And so we work hand in hand with our advisors and Kim and team are no exception to that to ensure that your information stays protected. One of the ways we do that is through recurring training. So every year uh, we do provide, you know, the Embrace Wealth Management team with a, a training about security and privacy best practices. Uh, with this training, it's going to educate them about, you know, the general landscape as far as with things that are going on. Um, and it's really going to educate them about our security policy that we have in place here at LPL to ensure that they're running a safe business. We have a personal relationship with a lot of our offices, right? Kim, team, and or exception to that. You know, if they have specific questions, uh, they can reach out directly to myself or Olivia or, you know, any member of our team, as mentioned before, and we'll be happy to provide them with accurate responses. And then we want them to continue to run a successful business, so we provide them with secure financial tools so that they can continue to focus on you know, what really matters most, and that's satisfying your needs as a client and continue to have success. And then here at LPL, uh, we work behind the scenes. Uh, Kim mentioned it before, we do have a dedicated cyber staff, over 175 employees, right, working hard really around the clock in most instances to identify different cyber threats. Uh, once those threats have been identified, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll proactively reach out to any advisor's office that's impacted um, as a result of one of these threats and provide them with guidance as far as with, you know, next steps so that they can uh, reduce their risk there. And then if there is an incident that occurs, we're going to support our advisor's offices as well. So, you know, we'll provide them you know, with cyber insurance as well to help them navigate any incidents as well as the support of our privacy team. So at a high level, this is the ecosystem that's in place to ensure that your information is protected and safe. All right, one thing I wanted to mention as well is the cyber fraud guarantee, right? And this is something that's pretty unique within the industry and it's public available for anyone here, really anyone to uh, view. It's on our website at lpl.com. And really, it's no different than the way that we've done business for years. But it is something that we wanted to publicly have available, um, you know, just to kind of reinforce our commitment to security. And so that cyber fraud guarantee states that, you know, we, we will reimburse you for 100 percent of any realized losses in your LPL account that occurred directly as a result to any unauthorized access to an LPL system. So if you are interested in learning more about that cyber fraud guarantee, uh, we do provide a pretty thorough explanation of it on our website. You can just go to LPL.com. Uh, you can scroll down to the bottom of the uh, initial homepage and select the security and privacy link, and then subsequently select uh, the link that'll take you to cybersecurity at LPL. All right, so now you know a little bit about kind of who we are as a team, right, and how we work hand in hand with our advisors offices to keep your information safe. Let's talk about the good stuff now, right? Let's kind of get into some of the cyber attacks and scams. And I mentioned, mentioned it before, uh, we're going to really focus on social engineering. So we're going to hear terms like phishing, ransomware. We'll talk about different scams, talk about email impersonations as well. And one thing I want to mention when I kind of talk about social engineering is that these attacks are all going to be designed to take advantage of you. Uh, they're designed to take advantage of human emotions. So that means that they won't work without you taking some action, right? Whether that's clicking on a link, whether that's opening an attachment, you know, in some sense, in some instances, it could be responding back to a text message uh, or it could be, uh, you know, answering a phone call, right? So uh, there are a number of different tactics that these bad actors use. 
Um, but if you're thorough, right, and if you learn to identify and avoid some of these tips, I mean, uh, some of these scams through some of the tips and tricks that we're offered today, uh, we feel confident that you can help to identify these different scams and attacks and protect yourself by avoiding them as well. So we'll start by talking about phishing. And I always like to joke when I talk about phishing, we are not referencing uh, the activity that involves a boat, right, or involves a rod or a reel. If we can go back to the last slide. I'm sorry, Olivia. Or a rod or a reel, right? We're actually talking about emails that are sent to a large group of people, right? And so with these emails, the goal is, to, is for the recipient, which would be you, to click on a link or to open an attachment or even call a phone number back, right? If you click on a link or if you open an attachment, ransomware can get deployed to your device. Essentially, what this is, is going to be malware that once it's deployed, it's going to lock you out or encrypt the files on your device, right? So you won't be able to access them. Uh, you actually get contacted by the bad actor and they will alert you that your device has been compromised. And the only way that you can access those files on your device is with the decryption key. And guess who has that decryption key? That's right. It's going to be those bad actors that have compromised your device, right? So that's why these attacks are called ransomware, because they're going to request a ransom payment in exchange for that decryption key so that you can get access uh, back to your data. We see scams packaged hand in hand a lot of the times with phishing attacks, but really in general, they're you know, applicable everywhere. And what these bad actors are doing with scams are they're just really tricking unsuspecting individuals to exposing information. And so depending on the type of scam is going to really determine what information is exposed, whether that be personal information, uh, financial information, they're looking to target a business or corporation. It could be proprietary or corporate information as well. And then email impersonations. This is something that's definitely applicable. You know, email is the primary form of communication for a lot of people. Um, and whether it's your personal email address, whether it's a, a business email address, or whether it's like a third party or, or corporation's email address, um, if you don't have adequate security to protect your accounts, and Olivia will give you some tips on how to do that later, right? These accounts could be susceptible to, uh, you know, unauthorized access. And what bad actors will do is once they have accessed your email account, they will look look to locate sensitive information, or they may even respond back to existing conversations, right? Imitating you in an attempt to commit fraud. So one of the controls that we have in place at LPL, and Kim and team know this, right? Anytime that there's a request to move money uh, from your account, right? Someone from her office is actually going to speak directly with you. And this is just a good way to prevent, you know, that type of fraud from having success or impacting your accounts. All right, so we talked about phishing earlier. I do want to just give you some general red flags or tips for identifying these phishing emails, right? And a lot of times what we're going to talk about today uh, as it relates to these different scams is exercising a term that I like to call human intuition, right? Or really just kind of using common sense and being thorough. Uh, gone are the days, unfortunately, where you can just look at an email, right, and determine whether or not it's a phishing email, uh, bad actors are using sophisticated tools uh, like generative AI tools like ChatGPT, for example, uh, that are able to craft emails now that have perfect grammar. And so you won't be able to really identify those uh, issues from the past. So when you're re getting an email from an unknown source, right, or even from a known source, you want to exercise that human intuition, as I referenced before. So if it's an unusual request or an a request with the unfamiliar tone with someone that you communicate with, you know, frequently, uh, you should reach out to that person and, and verify that request. So I'll give you an example of that. I'm going to use you as an example, Kim, here. So we've communicated multiple times prior to the webinar, right? We've had a couple of meetings just to make sure that we're aligned for the content. And there have all been pleasant experiences, right? She's very cordial, always pleasant when we communicate with her. If I got an email uh, from Kim's email address two or three weeks from now, right, they had a much different tone. Uh, there was a sense of urgency. You know, she was demanding, expecting me to do something immediately. You know, that doesn't set, that's not the Kim that I know, right? So what I would do is I would actually call her. I would speak with her and just verify that's a legitimate request. And so we'd recommend you kind of take that same thought process as it relates to the emails that you receive as well. Uh, you should never click on links or open attachments from any unknown sources, right? So if you get an email from an email address that you're not familiar with, it has a link or an attachment included in it, we'd recommend that you never click on that link or open the attachment. 
And then you want to be thorough and review emails for any inconsistencies uh, within the email. And this is really going to be important or pertinent when you're checking emails from your mobile devices, like your cell phones or your tablets, right? Uh, because when you're checking those emails from your mobile devices, what happens? You get an email and it just shows the name of the sender, but you don't actually see the email address of the sender. So what we're asking you to do is just to take this extra step to be thorough. You can click on the name of the sender, should provide you, take you to a subsequent page with a box where you can review the email address of the sender. All right, and that's what we're going to ask you to use that human intuition again, right? Make sure the name of the sender matches the email address of the sender. You want to be thorough when you're reviewing the email address as well. Uh, bad actors use a term called spoofing, right, where they may make small changes uh, to an email address, right? They may add like an extra S at the end of the domain, or they could replace like a lowercase I with a lowercase L. Now, something that if you're not thoroughly reviewing it, you may miss it. And if you miss it, you could be tricked into exposing information or fraud can occur. So these are just some general best practices as it relates to when you're checking your email. You know, one good tip as well is when, if you receive an email from an unknown source that you're not familiar with and you think it is a phishing email, you can just delete that email from your inbox and then delete it from your recycle bin as well, uh, you know, the old double delete. Another thing that you can do is to uh, mark it as junk and block the sender as well. What that's going to do is it's going to prevent any additional emails from coming from that specific email address. But if there's a but if there's a like a minor change to the domain, as we mentioned before, it's not going to prevent any additional emails from coming. But those are just some general tips that you can implement uh, when you're reviewing emails to avoid interacting with malicious emails. All right, so now I'll give you some examples of some additional phishing scams. I talked about what phishing was earlier. Uh, we're talking about smishing, phishing, and kissing. These are funny words, but these are legitimate scams, right? So when we talk about smishing, these are actually going to be phishing attacks that occur via text messages. And I myself fell victim to one of these attacks in the past. I think we have a little time. I'll tell the story real quick. Uh, so I was actually coming back from a trip from out of town. I'd gone away for the weekend and visited uh, Atlanta. I live in North Carolina. And when I was coming back, once I returned home, I received a text message from an unknown number indicating that I needed to you know, verify transactions with my bank account. So it made sense to me, right? A lot of times, uh, especially if you're enrolled in banking services, when you have different spending patterns that are not normal, you have to verify that they're legitimate transactions to ensure that they go through. So I received the text message. I clicked on the link and it took me to a landing page, which looked like my bank. So I, you know, I went ahead and I was prompted to enter my username, my password and my pin number. Right. So that should have been the red flag right there with the pin number. But I was kind of halfway paying attention, uh, kind of looking at TV with my daughter at the time. And so I entered my username, my password and my pin number and nothing happened. And I thought, hmm, well, this is strange. You know, we're. You know, where are the transactions? Why can't I verify the transactions? So I got the bright idea. Let me enter all my information again. So I enter my username, my password, and my PIN number again. And nothing happened again. And I'm thinking, like, what is going on here, right? Uh, so I took a closer look at the landing page. And, you know, I'll tell you, my heart sunk a bit because I had that aha moment. I saw there was a – the way, one of the words was slightly misspelled, right? It was just the European way the word was spelled. It was spelled with an S instead of a Z. And that was that indicator for me. Uh, so obviously I was in a panic state, right? And so I tried to log into my bank account. I couldn't log into my account because, you know, my password had been changed. So I tried to call the 800 number and talk to customer service. But, you know, my uh, questions and answers that I've been trained, my security questions for my account have been changed. So I couldn't pass authentication. Uh, so I had to go through the painstaking process of actually physically going to the branch the next day with my ID uh, to kind of tell them what happened and submit a fraud claim so I could try to reclaim back, you know, the funds that have been taken from my account. So that is just an example right there of kind of how these attacks can work and some of the tactics that these bad actors can use. So I will preference and say that. This happened to me before I was in security. I know some of the tips that I know now as well. And then another thing I want to just say as far as with how you can avoid falling victim to these attacks is one, 
you can always avoid uh, making sure that you uh, respond to text messages from unfamiliar numbers. And then another thing to remember, a lot of times these companies, when they contact you via text message now, they're just contacting you from like a five-digit number, right? It's not going to be uh, with that 10-digit number with the area code and subsequent seven digits that we're seeing a lot of times there. All right, so that's phishing. Uh, phishing is going to be phishing attacks that occur uh, via the phone, right? We'll talk about this a little later with some different scams, but you know, the goal of the bad actors, once they get the victim on their phone, uh, they're able to use strong technical language or you know high pressure tactics to you know get access to sensitive information or you know gain remote access to a device, right? Where they will remotely log into a device. Um, so you should never provide remote access to any unknown sources, right? That's the tip there. If you don't know, if you haven't verified who you're speaking with, uh, you don't provide them with access to your device. And then kissing, this is a newer one. Uh, this is going to be phishing via QR codes, right? So there's a trend out and about now you see QR codes uh, everywhere. You see them a lot of times in restaurants, even for like menus and stuff now, right? And so what bad actors are doing is they're putting malicious QR codes over legitimate ones and prompting people to enter their credentials, which is username and password, so they can steal those credentials and then commit fraud, similar to what happened to me with the text message. So one, while you're out and about, you should always kind of avoid scanning QR codes. Don't scan them unless you absolutely have to. If you are going to scan them, just you know be thorough and take a look at the code. Make sure there hasn't been any alterations. We'll see if you can like peel it off, right? Make sure there's not just a sticker on top of a legitimate one. And then another tip as well is that you should never be prompted to enter a password when you scan a QR code, right? So if you are prompted to enter a password, that's never do that, right? That's probably a scam right there, and it's an attempt to harvest your credentials. So these are just some different scams that we're seeing associated with phishing that are having some success just generally. All right, so I'll briefly just talk about elder fraud as well. Um, so we get this information from the FBI from a report that's released annually. I think they just released the information from 2023, so we're still kind of reviewing it. But uh, you kind of see the trends here as far as what's occurred, right? Let's start in 2020. You see the number of victims peaked at about 100,000 and dropped, you know, the next two years. But if we look at the losses, right, you know, 2020 was at under a billion. And then, you know, two years later, it ballooned to over $3 billion. And these are trends that are continuing, uh, you know, as the years continue. And so what this is telling us is that less people are being impacted by these scams, but those that are being impacted by the scams are, you know, suffering substantially more losses. Um, see customer service and tech support scams impacted the most victims. When you think about those scams, you know, these are scams that occur over the phone. Uh, some additional scams are romance or confidence scams. Um, these are really impacting every demographic. And so there's a, a scam out there called a pig butchering scam. I know it's uh, a pretty vulgar term, right? But it is a legitimate scam. Uh, impacting a number of different people. Uh, I believe last year in the U.S. it was estimated that it was nearly $4 billion of confirmed losses last year as a result of this scam. And this is kind of a, a hybrid romance scam, right? And you see it having success because of the popularity of like social media. Uh, what will occur is individuals will imitate other people and they'll reach out you know, to their victims, uh, start a conversation with them, gain their trust, and they will tell them about a, a cryptocurrency opportunity for them. So you start making smaller investments into this cryptocurrency opportunity, uh, and it looks like it's a legitimate platform. It's actually a fake platform, right? And they call it a pig butchering scam because what they're doing is they are really just fattening their victim up and then taking all their funds from them, right? So again, this is one of those scams that's relying on trust. Um, from uh, a stranger who's reaching out to you uh, and, you know, imitating someone that you know or claiming to have known you. So if you are contacted by someone, um, you know, if you're not familiar with, you know, we definitely recommend that you speak with a trusted source about the situation and kind of get their opinion on it as well. Uh, one other scam that I'll reference here is just going to be like lottery and sweepstakes scams. With lottery and sweepstakes scams, uh, we see this occur when individuals are told that they, you know, won some sort of prize, but they have to pay to receive their prize. Right? Obviously, you know, if you win, if you win the lottery, you win the lottery, right? You don't have to pay a fee to claim your prizes for the lottery. So again, when we talk about like exercising that human intuition, it's just different things like this. With bad actors, they're going to use, uh, you know, sense of urgency, try to get you to act upon, you know, a request as they'd like. 
you're ever unsure of the interaction that you're having, if it doesn't seem to be legitimate, as we mentioned before, you can talk to a trusted source, right? But you should immediately cease that interaction. You should never be pressured into making, you know, an immediate decision based off of an interaction that you're having with a stranger. All right, so we'll talk about some additional scams here. We kind of talked about investment scams early when I referenced the pig butchering scam. You know, that old saying of something's too good to be true, it normally is, is definitely relevant to this scam here. I'll just say this. If you're approached about an investment opportunity where someone's telling you that, you know, you have guaranteed returns on investment, there's little to no risk involved, right? I think we all know that those type of investments don't necessarily exist, but I'm just going to recommend that you speak with, you know, Kim and team and explain the situation to them and they can provide you with additional clarification um, as far as if it appears to be a legitimate opportunity. With invoice scams, we see these packaged hand in hand with email compromise a lot of times, right? Where a company's email address may be compromised and then bad actors will reach out um, via email indicating that, you know, hey, you just renewed a subscription. I think I had one the other day I shared with the team where it was like LifeLock or something, right? And so the goal of it is to kind of pique your interest and you look at the invoice and say, well, I don't have a subscription there, right? And so you call the number that's on the invoice and then that's how, you know, they, they get you on the phone and that's when they'll start using that sense of urgency there. Uh, so one other trend that we're seeing as it relates to invoice scams as well is a lot of times the emails won't even necessarily have any text within the body of the emails, right? So you'll just get an email with an invoice with uh, very vague or specific details that really aren't relevant to you and a, a phone number for you to call to get additional assistance there. All right, and tech support scams. Uh, we definitely see these as well impactful. These are when you get like fake pop-up messages indicating that there's an issue with your device. Uh, the key or a common indicator with these tech support scams is going to be a phone number. So it's going to be a phone number on that pop-up indicating that you can call that number for assistance or for technical support. Uh, so one, these large companies, they're not going to proactively contact you if there's an issue with your device, right? Uh, and two, if they do contact you, they're, they are not going to provide you with a phone number to call. So if you do receive uh, this pop-up, do not call the phone number on your device, on that uh, pop-up message. All right, so we'll briefly just talk about what to do if you fall victim to these attacks, right? I went over a lot of different attacks there. I um, mean, you know, there are different intricacies to all these attacks, and they're continuing to evolve, right? And so I think it's very important that you understand what to do if you fall victim. So first and foremost, you should change passwords to your accounts. Uh, if you have other accounts that have similar passwords associated with them, we'd recommend that you change those as well. And then make sure that you're monitoring your accounts. Make sure there's not any unusual, unauthorized activity that you're able to identify. If you are able to identify any unusual or unauthorized activity, uh, make sure that you reach out to the company, uh, your credit card company, your bank, and initiate a fraud claim as well. And then you're going to notify Kim and team. Um, so and it shouldn't just be if the information, if your LPL account, right, any of your information is exposed, right, notify them. What they can do is they can work with us here at LPL. You know, this kind of reinforces the earlier talking point I had about personal relationships with offices. They notify us and we can add heightened monitoring to your account as well to eliminate any additional fraud from your LPL account. And then lastly, uh, continue to educate yourself, right? Uh, continue to be proactive about a lot of these different topics. You know, as we mentioned, they are constantly evolving and they're evolving at a rapid pace. So don't let today's webinar be, you know, the first time you start thinking about some of these different topics or the first time that you have some of these conversations and don't let it be the last time as well. All right, so I feel like I've spoken for about 30 minutes straight here nonstop. Um, I hope I've captured your attention, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as with some of the different scams. I'm going to hand it off to Olivia. She'll give you some tips on how you can secure your accounts now. Thank you, Mike. That was all really great information. I know there's a lot of scams out there, so it can be overwhelming, especially since it feels like a lot of these are new and always changing, and there's just a lot of different uh, bad actors um, out there. So, but you guys are doing the right thing by being here today and learning about all the different ones. And 
really what this next section, um, securing your accounts, is about is being more proactive with what you have right now and how you can make that more cyber secure uh, to prevent any of these attacks from happening to you in the future, right? So getting started with securing your accounts, um, the main thing we want to talk about first is backing up data. So when you're storing or saving any data, it's important to keep all of that in one secure place that can be recovered, right? So you can do this by conveniently, conveniently storing any of your data in a secondary place like a cloud storage tool, uh, maybe like Google Drive or Dropbox you might be familiar with. Um, you could also use an external hard drive or you can use an encrypted USB drive just to keep all those important files safe and secure. And a lot of times your personal information and these files are often sought out by these bad actors. And so backing up any of this sensitive data and using one by one using one of these three spaces will really help ensure that that information is staying secure. And now I'm gonna talk about passwords. And I know this might seem a little bit of a drab, passwords aren't everyone's favorite subject to talk about, but kind of what Mike and I like to say is, um, we say that passwords are the keys to your kingdom. So for example, if you're driving and you're in a parking lot, you're not gonna go and leave your keys to your car just sitting in the car seat, right? And then walk away. Anyone could pick that up and take your car off, right? So same thing with passwords and your accounts. We don't want to make them super easy or just leave them laying around for any person to come across and get into your accounts and take all of that personal information that you might have in there. So passwords are the keys to your kingdom. And when it comes to passwords, um, um, it's important to have them as lengthy and as complex as possible. And so some tips, including when um, that we include Include here when talking about passwords is one really just avoid using any personal information. Um, a lot of the time, personal information can be easily available and accessible by hackers, especially anything that might be public on the internet, on your social media pages, or um, any other websites that might have your email or any other personal information on there from you. Um, a lot of those free apps um, does have your personal information on it. Also, if you're using that information that could be out there to anyone, it'll be a lot easier for anyone to get your password to your account. Uh, also, avoid using any dictionary words. Um, a lot of the time, these bad actors will use password cracking tools, and these tools can easily process all of those different words in the dictionary, run those, and then get could possibly get that easy password cracked into your account, right? Um, you also don't want to reuse any passwords. I know this can be really hard. I personally used to use the same password for every single one of my accounts. It was something really personal, like personal information about me. Anyone could have found out if they really got to know me. Um, and it was not very long. It was short. And yeah, it was it was not a good password. And using that for the same one of my accounts, if one person happened to find my password, they could have used it for every single one of my accounts. And then I would have had to spend years trying to repatch all of that damage, right? So be aware of reusing passwords and um, some a way you can kind of... Um, I'll talk a little bit about later is um, pa using passwords. Um, actually, I'll, I'll bring it up now, sorry. So for when it comes to reusing passwords, kind of a way to um, make that a little bit easier instead of reusing all your passwords is to use a password manager. So kind of what this is, is this is a um, solution where you can store all of your different passwords in one secure vault. Um, so to hold all those login information passwords, um, that way you can easily, when you go into easily log into each one of your accounts, it'll pop up that password for you. And you don't have to remember all those long and complex passwords that might be out there. And a lot of those password managers also um, create complex passwords um, for you as well. So you don't have to make it up on your own. It'll make them all different and it'll easily populate those into each account that you might have. So um, when it comes to choosing a password manager, we don't personally recommend any specific one. Um, there are a lot of different free and paid ones that are out there. Um, so definitely recommend you that you do your own research um, on the different password managers. And one of the articles that we like to recommend is a website called PC Magazine or PCMag.com. 
on there. There's a really great article on password managers of just the different ones, pros and cons to each, um, free and paid ones, what might be best for you. Definitely recommend looking into that a little bit more um, for sure. And then following up here, um, also enabling two-factor authentication. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And then we also want to avoid typing passwords while using public Wi-Fi. So I know this can be hard because a lot of times if you're traveling or if you're in a restaurant or at your hotel or the airport, you want to quickly go on, log into your accounts using that public Wi-Fi network. It's convenient. It's there. But a lot of times these bad actors are hiding out on these public Wi-Fi networks and they can easily watch over you while you type in these passwords. And so um, kind of a way um, to avoid this, if you do need to use those public networks, which totally makes sense if you do need to do that, um, you can use something called a VPN or a virtual private network, um, or you could use a mobile hotspot from your phone. Kind of what the VPN does is it will mask um, your identity when you're on that public network. Um, it won't show your IP address and will not allow for those bad actors to see any activity or that your presence is there on that public Wi-Fi network. Um, so now going on further about passwords, we have a really interesting graphic here um, that um, you can take a look at. Um, kind of compares um, the strength of your password from how long it might be to um, how many, how much complex it might be. So if you look on there, if we see a six character password, um, if that has all of those requirements or those complexity measures there, that could be cracked instantly from a password cracking um, tool that a bad actor might have. Whereas if we have a 16 character password and we have all of those different complexity requirements that might be there, that would take 5 billion years to crack. So that this graphic really gives some perspective on what type of password you might have and how easy that password could be cracked. So if you see, think about your password and you see it on this graph and see, oh, maybe it would take 28 seconds to crack my password. Or if it takes 5 billion years, you'll definitely be sleeping a lot better at night knowing your password would take 5 billion years to crack by a bad actor, right? So really great perspective here. Definitely something you should take away from today and keeping those passwords safe and secure as they are those keys to your kingdom. And now I'm going to talk about uh, multi-factor authentication. So again, this is another best practice for keeping all of your accounts secure. What MFA is, is it's an additional layer of security that requires you to complete two methods of verification in order to gain access to your account. So MFA verifies um, something that you know, which is your username or password, and something that you have, is, which is that unique code. So for example, if you're going to log into your bank account, you type in your username and password, and then you'll get sent a little code on your phone, or you'll get sent a, a message saying, is this you? And you'll check yes or no. Um, that is multi-factor authentication. So you might be familiar with this already with some of your accounts, but a lot of accounts today do have this capability. So we definitely recommend um, setting this up wherever you see fit for your accounts, uh, definitely for your bank accounts, um, email accounts, any social media accounts. Um, a lot of the time this um, method will be available and um, it's really helpful, especially in the off chance that that bad actor does get your password. They still won't be able to get into your account without having your phone and verifying that identity that it is you trying to log in. So moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about protecting your family. And our first um, step in protecting your family is just internet best practices. So we all use the internet here in our day-to-day -day lives, but misuse of the internet can lead to increased cyber risks. So Definitely um, important to take advantage of these four tips we have here below. So the first one is keep your browsers and plugins up to date. You'll hear me mention this a couple more times. Um, keeping all your software, especially your internet browsers up to date is really gonna help prevent any of those vulnerabilities that might be out there um, from impacting, um, and those bad actors taking advantage of those and impacting you and your accounts, right? So just going ahead and going through the process of ups keeping them up to date is gonna be one easy step to help you keep um, your internet best practice safe and secure. Again, also always wanna use a VPN if you are connected to public Wi-Fi. Um, especially using the internet, you're typing in those passwords or searching something up that might be private information or doing your business. And um, we don't want anybody else lurking in and seeing what you're doing, right? So while you're using the internet. So use a VPN or avoid using those public Wi-Fi networks when using the internet. Um, we also want to use credit cards or any third-party apps for payments. 
Um, a lot of times, it, if you're using like a debit card or just direct access to your bank account when making a payment, it's a lot harder to go back and um, recover that account in case it did um, get found out by a bad actor and such. So kind of using these credit cards or any other third-party apps to make any payments is going to be another secure way um, to do that over the internet. And then finally, we only want to share sensitive information on legitimate secure websites. And so you might be wondering, what is a legitimate secure website? How do I even find that out? A um, couple of tips we have is just look in the URL, see if they're, um, what it says at the top is like HTTP. And then if there's an S at the end, that S actually stands for secure. And so a lot of times you'll see um, those main websites you might be searching like Amazon, Facebook, you name it. They'll have the HTTPS to ensure that that is a secure website. Um, another tip um, that I always recommend is when you go to one of these websites and you know where you're going, you know if it's just Amazon.com or something of that nature. Um, if you, in the half chance, mistype and you spell Amazon with some other random characters, some, a lot of times these bad actors will create what, these fake websites because of those typos that are really easy to type in when searching for a website directly into the URL. So when you're going to look for one of these websites, instead of typing it directly into the URL at the top of the page, just go into your web browser and type in and space. Don't type in the .com or the .net at the end of it. Have it search for you and then use that search engine to click on that secure and safe link. Um, now we talked a little bit about internet best practices. Now we're going to move into mobile device tips. So we all use the internet. We also use our mobile phones as well. So definitely want to help make sure that your phones are safe and secure also. I know you heard Mike mention that a lot of those um, statistics on attacks that might happen or scams come from mobile devices as well. And so we have to also have to make sure we're looking out for our phones um, when you're using them also. So one big thing, I already mentioned this, update your software regularly. Really quick, easy way to help make sure that your phone is staying safe from those vulnerabilities that come up. Um, your phones look out for, and your phone companies look out for those different vulnerabilities where a bad actor might try to slip through and see what damage they can do. And so they create these updates and these patches to prevent them from coming in and doing that. And so you making sure that you go in and do those updates and listen to what might be out there is going to be a good way to help keep your phone secure. Um, we also only want to install known and trusted apps from official app stores. So you might be surprised that there actually are um, apps out there that are bad. And I know it's unfortunate, but it, it does happen. So whenever you're going to go and download a new app, just look out for um, what you might be installing. Do your research on it before um, installing it to your device. I know this week I saw a big headline with Android had a, a new app that many, many people had installed and it was a malicious app. So keep, keep your, stay vigilant about those apps that might be out there. Um, also, re encourage you to use mobile security software. Um, this is just a software that can scan your device for malware and protect the phone from viruses. Really going to help prevent any potential risks that come to your phone in the future. And then also, you want to turn on your user authentication. So password to your phone. Make sure you have one, whether that's your face ID, your PIN code, um, your fingerprint. Have that turned on and then use a strong password as well. Really going to help make sure that if your phone ever gets lost, it won't be that easy for someone to come in, open it up, and do whatever they want with it, right? And now that we talked a little bit about mobile device tips, now we're going to talk about securing your home. Um, so you might be familiar with something called the Internet of Things or IoT. Um, this is um, a device or any device that has a sensor on it and is connected to the Internet. So, for example, you might be familiar with a smart TV or smart thermostat. Um, something that connects to your phone or even a smart toaster I've actually heard about. You might be surprised. Um, so definitely um, might, might need, not be aware that the Internet of Things um, can be impacted as well. So these devices, um, some best practices to look into is just updating that software regularly again, changing those default passwords that might um, already come with the device, um, ensure that your device has um, that unique password um, that's complex as possible, um, enabling multi-factor authentication when it's available, and then opting out of any data tracking or just any other preferences that might automatically come with that device on the Internet of Things. And now I'm going to talk about traveling safe. So 
Um, when traveling, it's important to value security over convenience, as a lot of times traveling can um, create some unknown circumstances, and tourists are way more subject to different scams incidents when going to new places. So first tip, always stay vigilant of your surroundings, protect your belongings, and be cautious of those risks that might be around you. Um, learn about the local scams or that are in the place that you're going to. Um, do some research beforehand. You might not be sure if one is more common for pitpocketing or another scam that might be out there. Um, always want to avoid um, using public Wi-Fi. And then also, we want to use a portable charger as well. So um, we've recently seen more higher cases of something called juice jacking. This is where a bad actor will compromise any of those charging spaces um, that might be free, like an airport you might have seen. And then from there, they could upload any malware to your device when you plug it in. So what we just recommend, bring your own portable charger, charge it in a safe place um, just to avoid any of that scam from happening to you. And then now we're gonna talk about how we can protect your identity. So um, I definitely wanna make sure that your personal information is protected and um, that your identity is safe as well. So first thing is um, freeze your credit um, when you feel like you are at risk of identity theft. Um, review that your account activity regularly. Um, make sure that if there are any other purchases that are coming into your account, you're checking up on those, ensuring that was you who did them. Um, look out for any of those phishing emails that Mike was talking about earlier. Um, know that these bad actors are trying to create messages that are urgent, but wanting you to interact with it right away, not even think about if this is a scam or not. And then finally, use those strong passwords I was talking about earlier. It's going to be a really quick, easy way to protect your identity. And then finally, last, I wanted to talk about how you can best protect your family. Unfortunately, any of these cyber attacks can happen to anyone. And so you being here today is a really great way to learn all this information and then pass this on to your family and friends is going to be a good way to keep everyone in your network safe and secure. So first thing that we recommend is that you discuss cyberbullying. Unfortunately, that is something that exists in today's world, but you having these conversations with everyone in your family and um, creating a password like we have in that third step there or a safe word that you can share with anyone in your family in case something bad is happening to them is going to be a good way to uh, make sure they're all on the same page and know what to do if something did happen. I also want to take precautions on social media. Social media is a great tool, but um, things do happen on there and because they are free apps a lot of the times. Um, we don't have as much control on what information can be shared with others. Um, and posting a lot of personal information on social media apps, you're not sure where that information could be going. So to discuss social media um, and discuss taking those precautions and just staying vigilant of what could be out there. And then finally, proactively learn about those cyber threats. Again, you're doing the right thing by being here today, learning about the ones that are, be out, that are out there, but um, this shouldn't be the last step in your, your search for cybersecurity and the different threats that could be around. Definitely recommend you continue to do your research, learn about what is out there, and continue to educate yourself on cybersecurity and how you can continue to stay safe and, of course, protect your family. So this leads us to our last slide here. It's our call to action. Um, again, LPL is committed to working with your advisor's office. We hope you take that away from you today. Um, if you do ever need any, have any other questions after this, definitely reach out to Kim. We're happy to work with her and continue to help support you in her office as well. Um, another step you want, want you to take away from today is just social engineering attacks. Take advantage of your emotions. Mike was talking a lot about these different types of scams. Be wary of any um, of those um, trustworthy sorts of things that don't go into trusting any of these sources too quickly. A lot of those attacks are urgent, trying to get you to click on something quickly and trust an unknown source. Um, yeah, don't go in and click on and any of those emails if you're not familiar with it or open any of those unknown attachments. And then we also want to value security over convenience, um, especially when we're traveling. Make sure, sure you're using those VPNs and avoiding those public Wi-Fi networks. And then finally, definitely protect your accounts and protect your family. Enable multi-factor authentication, change those passwords, make them different, make them secure, and then share all the news that you learned today with your family and friends and help make sure that they're safe and secure as well. And that, that's it for our presentation today. We hope you learned a lot about what cybersecurity is, how you can stay safe, secure. Hopefully you took something away from today. Um, you might have a couple of questions, so Mike and I definitely be happy to answer any of the questions you might have.
Yeah, so uh, anyone, um, you're welcome to throw our questions into the chat. And um, I've had a couple of clients actually uh, call ahead of time and say, please ask this because I'm not able to to make it and share my story. And uh, so like, uh, for example, my story is that um, our family, Amazon is a verb at my house. <laughs> it's just like Amazon, it's just get on Amazon, put it in the cart, send it. And so as, as vigilant as I think I am, I couldn't believe it, but I got one of those emails that said, oh, your delivery from Amazon uh, couldn't go through. Uh, yeah, here's the tracking number to figure out where it is. I clicked on it and as soon as I did, I saw that landing page and like Mike said, is not as obvious anymore that it doesn't have to be some sort of story about a Nigerian prince that wants to marry you or give you an inheritance. They use Grammarly, they use spell check, they use much better quality graphics. It's not as obvious as it is. And, um, and so I did pick up the tip from another cybersecurity webinar to check for that uh, hyperlink, where if you hover over the email, it will uncover what the true email is. And so when I looked at it, it was Amazon, uh, like <laughs> uh, smell, spelled weird. But then also to uh, look for that HTTPS, uh, if it's missing the S, is not a secure site. So it just makes you pause for a moment and look because it's they're designed to be urgent. Um, so great tips. Really, thank you so much, Mike and Lovia. This is such wonderful tips. I just wrote like pages and pages of, uh, of notes. And uh, so let me see if there's any other questions that popped into the chat. Is there uh, anything else that anyone wants to add, whether a story or a uh, question or a comment? You're welcome to uh, raise your hand. Wait a minute here. Does anybody else have a near miss story? While we're waiting, I guess I'll just hop in and I'll just get my takeaways for the group as well, right? So I think one of the things Olivia mentioned, as far as with using a safe word at the very last slide, I kind of want to really harp on that and reiterate that because I think a lot of times if there is an active scam going on or if you're being, you know, in the midst of fraud, uh, you may have tunnel vision, right? You're not always thinking clearly. You may be focused on just resolving a quote-unquote emergency instead of identifying the scam. Right. So by having that safe word or that password, it does provide, you know, an additional step, right, of verification that actually needs to be completed before you act upon a request. And in some instances, that, you know, verification of that safe word could be the one thing that prevents you from acting on a request and committing fraud or, you know, no, wait a minute, you know, you can't verify this. Like Kim knows the safe word, right? She should know the safe word. And then that should be that aha moment for you. Uh, another thing is just to make sure that you're using long passwords, right? Um, I think the slide where the graphic just showed, you know, uh, with six, right, we did six seconds versus five billion years or something like that, right? Um, you know, it's just very important to have those long passwords as well. And when you think about passwords, Olivia mentioned it, they're the keys to your kingdom, but they really are one risk that you can control directly. Uh, with every account that you have, you determine how long or how complex your passwords are. And then I guess the last one is just make sure that you're updating your software to prevent those bad actors from taking advantage of known vulnerabilities, right? And that should be software really in every circumstance, whether that's, you know, the mobile devices, which is your cell phones, your iPads, or those, um, you know, IoT devices that she was referencing, right? Grills, you know, uh, televisions, refrigerators, the, the all the Alexa products, right? All those different things as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. And so we have just one more minute, but I have, see, Taffy, you have your hand up. What would you yeah. Like? So my question, um, you said to be very careful when you're using other Wi-Fi and whatnot when you're out. So my husband and I travel a lot 
And a lot of the hotels have it, well, you get on their Wi-Fi and then you can log on and watch Netflix with your own account and all that. So is that not something we should be doing? I mean, we log out and all that, but once we're on there, we're on their Wi-Fi, but you have to be on their Wi-Fi to connect to the, whatever it's called, you know, the network. Yeah, no, that's a great question there. So a lot of times what we're really referencing is that unsecure public Wi-Fi. So unsecure public Wi-Fi is going to be any Wi-Fi network that doesn't require a password for you to join it. Or if that password is just plastered on the wall somewhere where anyone and everyone can see it right, it's not going to make it a secure network. So a lot of times with hotels, one of the things that we're seeing now is you do have to go through some form of verification, right? Whether it's like your last name and the room number, there's some sort of combination there. But there, there are risks associated with that too, right? Because it's the same combination for, you know, every room. And so if someone just happens to know that you're staying there, right, they could possibly get on that network. So that's why we recommend using that VPN, a mobile hotspot, is another good option as well because that will provide you with like a secure network that with a password that you know you or your husband could access as you're traveling as well. Um, that could yeah. be another alternative. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Great tips, and um, <laughs> I took so many notes. Half of it scared the heck out of me. So <laughs> thank you so much, Mike and Olivia, for joining us uh, this evening. This was really wonderful. Really. Uh, in foreign when we appreciate you so much. And I also want to uh, um, express my gratitude too for everyone that has joined us tonight. We really appreciate that. So we will send out the uh, recording. And so thank you so much for just staying engaged and being a part of my life. I 